And if you're just tuning into the the podcast for the first time, we do take a take a about 15 to 20 minutes at the start just to do a recap because the episodes can be, you know, like four hours long. So we do a recap. Um, we cut out that recap. It's an entirely separate video if you're just trying to get caught up. And then we do like our deep dive, like thoughts, reactions, whatever that immediately follows it. So if you're watching just the recap video, you can click, click the link below and get taken over to our full discussion of the episode. Um, so having said that, um, and by the way, I, I will just give a disclaimer. I don't think anyone can hear it, but like kids are screaming in the background. Everything's going crazy over here. Um, so if the mic picks it up, sorry. <laughs> You're so, good. Having said that, let's talk about what happened in this week's episode of Campaign 3 of Critical Role. And this episode was episode 26. It's called Hidden Truths. And there are some hidden truths that happened in this episode. This was a pretty yeah. amazing episode. That's why Will probably kept texting me, have you seen it yet? <laughs> um, the episode basically opens up with the party being like, yeah, we're, we're going to sleep for the night. Like we're going to, you know, we've wrapped up our day's stuff. Let's get some sleep. And uh, Fern and Dusk have this really sweet moment of just swapping ideas on identity and past history. And, you know, they kind of talk about um, Bertie and Ollie, Fern's parents, and just the Feywild. And it's just like a nice, you know, it's what you expect at a table of two players kind of bonding a little bit in character. And then, uh, you know, after all that's said and done, they're like, all right, well, good night. Well, this wholesome moment is very short lived because then Matt says, I need everyone to leave the table except for Erica, which everyone's like, okay, what is going on? So they all leave and Erica gets a mental message from, uh, let me pull up the name because it was so freaking amazing in terms of the name um, of the guy. Sorrow, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorrow, Sorrow Lord, Z Z Sorrow Lord. Zathuda, bearer of the lightless flame, grove captain of the unseely court. And this person has bad dude written all over him and is immediately like, what's the status on your mission? And it's basically revealed. Erica's accent voice all changes. And she basically says, I'm still looking for the Callaways. I'm still looking for something called the Moontide Crown. Um, and also says, Hey, did you know that the Callaways had a daughter named Fern? Uh, we don't really get much answer there other than it doesn't seem like he is aware. Uh, but you know, in typical bad guy conversation, uh, he's basically like, you know, get the crown and kill the Callaways like in that line that, uh, and you know, beep, you know, hang up on the phone kind of deal. And Erica looks down at this black ring that seems to be humming and tugging towards Fern's room. So it seems to be some kind of Callaway tracking thing. Um, but it was a huge reveal because it seems like Dusk is not to be trusted. Um, so anyway, everyone comes back to the table. They see actually Erica with like a look of concern. And they're like, oh, no, something so sad happened to you. <laughs> and it was just very sweet, very wholesome, because everyone's like, oh, I'm so sad. I, you know, whatever you went through, I'm here for you. And it's like, yeah, she just talked to her boss about murdering you guys. But, you know, <laughs> no big deal. Right. Um, so you think that the night's over. Well, no, uh, we have a dream for Imogen. And Laura Bailey is like, shoot, no, not again. Um, and this time it's it's the the the, the dream has already progressed to the point of like the storm coming in. She sees the figure uh, where like other figures jumped out behind this character in an earlier dream. It appears to be a woman with gray hair. Um, there's not much of a description there other than um, looks evil is basically the best way to describe it. <laughs> yeah. And figures, dozens of figures step out from behind her wearing masks. And this figure speaks to Imogen in her mind and basically says, how interesting. And then all these characters rush at her uh, and she wakes up. So uh, the most interesting, th interesting thing about this dream is when she wakes up, she looks out the window and she sees Ruidus setting and it's has um, it's, it's like flaring. flaring. Yeah. Yeah. It has like this bright red light coming off it. Um, and then it subsides and calms in a very ominous way. Um, so everyone gets up for the day. Um, oh, I should mention that Orm does steal Captain Xanus' spyglass from Fern, um, which not quite sure what he's doing with that yet. But uh, in the morning, they're talking about, you know, like, what do we want to do today? What do we want to, like, what do we want to do about this plan? Um, 
And no sooner than they've left where they're staying, <clears throat> do basically a group of what appear to be thugs sort of fan out and surround them. And a dwarf who's missing his thumbs uh, basically walks up, identifies himself as Tanvir the Rake of the Paragon's Call, and that they notice them snooping around the Seat of Disdain, and they want to know, what the heck are you doing? Party kind of tries to, um, you know, they, they lie. They try to convince this guy, like, oh, oh, that was your place? Like, oh, no, we were looking after this <laughs> um, uh, Quoka that, you know, got stuck under your gate. He's not buying it. Uh, and basically they say, yeah, actually we're here for work for general Ratanish. you know, Ashton's had a fight with him and, you know, one of the, uh, thugs is kind of like, oh yeah, I remember that fight. Um, and Tandra is kind of like, oh, that's interesting. Okay. So you guys know Ratanish. Okay. Well, we're going to go find out how true this is. Like if you really are here for work, uh, and if you're not, then we're going to come back tomorrow and basically, you know, beat you up, kill you, who knows what. So they leave. The party like basically freaks out because they're like, okay, now they're going to know that we're here and it's going to be very obvious that like, why is this group from uh, Dressar now here? So they immediately start thinking about solutions. What do we need to do? Um, they know that to get Captain Zandis to come pick them up, he needs 24 hours notice. So they know the time is ticking. And so they also know there's other things they want to do, like follow up on uh, people that they know. So they decide, basically, let's split up into uh, a few different parties. Let's go um, check off a bunch of different things, and then we'll just go from there. So having said that, um, Ashton, Chetney, and uh, Imogen head to the All Minds Burn Palace, which is this odd place where it's like a social place, but it seems to be where everyone's kind of like um, mentally etherneted in to yeah. some kind of like group think Super system. Weird. It's very weird. Um, and not only that, Imogen actually tries to kind of tune in herself and immediately detects some, a, a large staticky, painful um, sensation that causes her nose to bleed and she has to stop detecting thoughts, but she detects something incredibly large beneath the surface, very ominous. Uh, yeah. And it's also here that um, they meet uh, a friend of Ashton's named Justy. It's a red uh, Asfura. Is, is that right? As, Asfura? I think so. I think so. Uh, bird person. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and the person's like, Ashton, wow, it's been forever. And Ashton basically says, hey, we just need to know we need a place to lie low um, because we think we have a guy that we're thinking about basically kidnapping and we need 24 hours till our help arrives to take us out of here. Could we potentially stay here if we needed to? And Jesse's like, yeah, you could potentially do that, but you could also um, do the run and that might settle things. And the run is basically a death race kind of run. It's not for money. It's not for prizes. It's basically... Think of like a duel to settle issues. You do this Mad Maxian death race kind of run, and it's never fair. And Justy even says, like, we could lay some traps for you guys that would be um, um, beneficial to you guys and would basically help you win the race. So he's like, I like that plan. Okay, we might do that then. And naturally, I'm sure every viewer was like, oh, my gosh, we're going to do this for sure now. Let's go. <laughs> yeah, so um, that happens there. Um, also, uh, FCG takes Ferd and Dusk, um, to basically look for someone named Esmer, who was like an old contact when he was with Dancer. And in meeting Esmer, um, FCG is like, Hey, I don't know how to say this, but Dancer and everyone is dead basically. Uh, and it's really this funny to see where they're like, Hey, let's not, let's let him down easy though. I like your shirt, <laughs> you know, but Esmer basically laughs and is like, what are you talking about? I saw Dancer a month ago. Uh, which he's like, wait, what? How could that even be possible? Um, and suddenly, and this is a theme in the episode, FCG starts to really question what he remembers and what's actually true. Esmer also mentions that um, uh, Dancer had a, a new arm, a metal arm, um, maybe after whatever incident happened. Uh, and he basically says, do you know where she might be? And he says, uh, Esmer says, um, she says, you know, you could check the ends, 
Um, it's also where uh, Imahara Joe's is. Um, FTG remembers that they kind of hated each other uh, and decides, yeah, maybe we should go uh, check out the ends. So um, having said that, it's pretty much what happens in the first half. Do you want to talk about the second half? Yes, sir. I got you. So we have the break. We pick back up and we're picking back up with Ladna and Orem, who are like this third group that split off. And the first thing they do is go shop for just some disguises since they're basically, you know, uh, recognizable from the, the, the ball back in Drusar and just they want to, you know, be a little bit more discreet. So they go buy some clothes and they eventually come up with this bit of uh, Orem pretending to be Ladna's son, Georgie, kind of a callback to uh orm doing the same thing in exu uh, nancy with, uh opal <laughs> yeah um so now in their disguises they head to the seat of disdain just to basically stake it out and kind of see what they can discover um during they talk a little bit about um the fight between laudna and imogen she kind of spills the beans to orm and you know they, they talk that out a bit um but eventually orm just kind of does his stealthy thing and tries to see what he can see and they eventually see three people come out on the roof, basically taking a smoke break. And uh, one of these people is Armand Treshi. Um, meanwhile, the group of uh, Ashton, Imogen, and Chetney, and also the group of Fern, Dusk, and FCG are converging back uh, in this area of the of Basaros known as the Inns, which is basically like this big junkyard section of the city. You know, crawler parts, automatons buzzing around. Um <clears throat> Heading there to head to Imahara Joe's. Um, and they're basically discussing the Death Wish race on the way and if that's something they want to actually explore. Um, so they make it to Joe's. They get inside. Joe lets them in. And Ashton says they're looking to purchase a crawler, which is, you know, the little vehicle that they would use in the race. Joe says he has a couple of crawlers. They're not 100% like ready to go though. Um, and Joe is immediately fascinated with FCG, as many people have been this campaign. Um, so then there's a lot of talk about the crawlers. Do we need both of them? Should we just take one? What add-ons should we get? Because there's a bunch of like enhancements. You can get extra armor, stuff like that. So there's a lot of you know table talk about what exactly they want to do here. And while they're still figuring that out, uh, Fern asks Joe about her parents, since you know that's where her mom said to meet them. Um, and Joe reveals that, yeah, he's familiar with them. They come in all the time and buy these power sources and fern is like yeah those are my parents and he's like oh my gosh yeah you look just like them um <clears throat> so they make that connection and then joe asks fcg he's like hey did you used to run around with somebody named dancer because you look so familiar and fcg says yeah like i did and joe's like okay i knew it like i remember back when dancer bought you off that caravan you know i almost bought you um yeah. but you know she beat me to it uh you're you know grade a and he's like wait what no dancer built me uh and joe's like no i was there you know you were purchased uh grade a automaton pre-divergence probably from aor like you're super special and f this of course you know blows fcg's mind um you know I'll, I'll calling back to the fight uh calling back to the moment earlier in the episode where he learned dancer was still alive and now he's being hit with this um fcg is just processing a lot right. and uh Joe also kind of spills some history on this type of stuff. He's like, yeah, uh, back in Aeor, they somehow figured out how to create these sentient automatons, um, but the technology was lost. But in recent years, these automatons have been springing back up at various places over the world. Um, they then asked Joe, hey, say, when's the last time you saw a dancer? And he says it was about a year ago. Um, hasn't seen her since. And <clears throat> he also says that he would love to, like, inspect fcg with his consent just to learn more about this like ancient impressive technology and fcg is open to this um uh, because he would also like to know more about himself get some answers um but that's not going to happen right now because for now bell's Hells has some more right. pressing matters um the party ultimately decides to buy one of the crawlers, not two, and uh, they give him a down payment of, I think, 500 gold now, and the rest will come tomorrow. It's a thousand total um, once Joe has finished fixing it up or whatever. So the party leaves, and they decide to find a new place to stay for the night, um, and Ashton begins leading them toward a uh, to a place known as the undercarriage. Uh, but on the way, they're discussing Fern's parents, and 
Fern reveals that she has all these postcards from them, one even coming from Aeor. And right. the party's like, what the heck? Like, Aeor's ancient. Like, what do you mean it came from Aeor? And so there's a bunch of discussion and, like, we got to inspect these. And they, they do learn that all the cards are handwritten um, and in the same handwriting. Right. And uh, some, I think Travis, I don't know if it was as Chetney or as Travis, but he was like, there's probably a code in there. Like, let's let's see if they hid some sort of code in these messages. So I think Laudna that night is going to sit down and maybe take a deeper look at them. Um, but that's where the episode ends. Man, yeah. Um, so that's what happened in episode 26 of Campaign 3, Hidden Truths. Again, if you're checking out, just a recap, click the link below for your um, for our full thoughts and theories and share some of your thoughts and theories. So 